The 16th of June uh, this year will be the 48th anniversary of the June 16 Soweto Uprising, uh, Youth Day as it is commonly called. It is a day which uh, South Africans remember the over 500 youngsters who were slain on the 16th of June 1976 when the police ambushed them in Soweto. But do South Africans still value the meaning of Youth Day? We will find out. Bahai to Dumelang, good evening. My name is Tabo Mulukwani. Welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight we get to evaluate if young South Africans still see the value in celebrating Youth Day, particularly looking at the crucial challenges facing the education system in the nation, as well as some economic challenges that are unique to young people in the country. Now joining us uh, to this conversation is Wamohetsu Chikwado, who is the former Secretary General of the SRC there at the Twani South uh, Tivet College, as well as Klein Boikekane, who is a facilitator for primary school programs. They're both uh, joining us in studio this evening. Uh, guys, much appreciated for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think maybe let's start the conversation by um, just looking at, uh, you know, if South Africans still value, you know, celebrating um, Youth Month or just June 16 in general. Maybe let me start with you. Um, in my knowledge, I would say they still do celebrate June 16. They still do value June 16 um, to the greatest extent. Uh, in continuation, I will say that as much as there's still that June 16 vibe, but there's still much more to do mm. to South African youth. Mm. Um, what do you think? Um, do you think it still holds uh, the same significance as uh, over the years? Uh, good evening to the listeners at home and good evening to you. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name is introduced is O Amakhetsi Chikwado. I am um, a member of Black Women Caucus. And Black Women Caucus, let me just maybe give a brief ex uh, explanation of what Black Women Caucus is. We are a youth led feminist organization, an intergenerational organization for that fact, um, that was founded in 2017 in response to the growing pandemic of GBVF in the country, right? And so basically, the work that we do is organizing community workers. We we organize women in informal settlements. We even organize adolescent young boys and girls, you know, to talk about issues of gender-based violence and femicide and just issues in general, right, that has to do with young people. Because like I said, we are a youth-led organization, right? And so going back to your question, is, you know, are the, are the young people of South Africa still celebrating or do they really understand the significance of June 16? I think to, to a certain extent, it is true. However, I think the, re the, the narrative has completely changed now. Yeah. June 16 is seen as a day for celebration where young people just go out in the streets and be rebellious. But there's actually not enough education about what June 16 actually is and what it means for young people, you know. I think what we need to do is then educate more young people about what June 16 really is about and why we should be celebrating such a significant day, you know. It should not just be a day of us going out to party and just drink and just enjoy that one day, but we really need to, you know, acknowledge the people that you know for the freedom and the rights that we have today as young people and especially in our education in, in especially in our education education system <laughs> sorry about that um, look um, you know I'm interested in finding out uh, I mean your views particularly looking at um, the theme for this year I mean mm -hmm. actively embracing socio-economic gain, gains mm -hmm. of our democracy I mean we are 30 years into democracy there quite a lot a lot of challenges over the years um, you know, especially looking at uh, the challenges that are faced uh, by young people, we will talk about some of them and, and, and stuff. But do you think as a country uh, we've made strides, uh, Clean Boy, uh, over the years? Uh, you know, we are 30 years later. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen, you know, the gains, especially benefiting young people? Um, quite interesting. So uh, I would say that uh, we are still getting there. We are still getting there because uh, there's a lot that has been done but it, it, it doesn't really create that much of a change that we really need as young people. Because young people in the current state of the economy, current state of the country, yeah. we still have a lot to go through. We still have a lot to achieve because most of the things are not yet being achieved. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of uh, socioeconomic factors that needs to be addressed and be well underlined to create a better sustainable economic growth in Africa. And not just in South Africa, but the whole Africa as a whole. So I would say that, uh, yes, we are getting there, but we are not yet there. Mm. We still have a long way to go. Mm. We still have a long way to 
help our youth to understand what are we here for, what are we here to do, and what are the the the, the, the benefits that we need to get as time goes on. Yeah. Mm. I mean, what is it like, you know, um, uh, being a South African youth today? Sure. I think um, it feels amazing to know that I have rights that protect me. Oh. However, I do feel like those rights have their limitations as well, right? Because with every right comes a responsibility. And most often than never, is the responsibility part is what the conversation that we as young people are not trying to have, right? Yeah, However, we're just so entitled about all the rights that we have and we expect all things to happen just by the look of it being great. You know, um, I do believe that South Africa has so much potential to become a very brilliant country and it all lies in the hands of the youth, you know. And I think our biggest problem now is the fact that many of our young people uh, have this mentality of things being given to them, right? Like I said, that we're a very uh, entitled, you know, country in actual fact. Our young people are very entitled and they don't want to do things. Instead, they expect things to be done for them. And so this is why it's important for us to even encourage ourselves, even as peers, you know, to get involved in skills development programs so that we can embed ourselves even before expecting change from the country as, a, as you know, from the government or the state, you know, that controls us. However, I do think that being a young person in South Africa is where it's at because the fun is in South Africa. However, mm -hmm. with every fun comes responsibilities. And I think um, the responsibility part is what we really need to work on as a country. However, I can really say that I am happy to be in South Africa with its limitations, of course. You know, when we look at the gender-based violence and femicide cases in South Africa growing each and every day, every second hour, every second minute, a, sac a child is abducted or, you know, kidnapped. And so it also worries me as a young black person, as a young black girl in actual fact in South Africa, am I really safe in this country that I speak so greatly about because we're such a be beautiful rainbow nation country. However, I do feel that in as much as we are so beautiful and we might seem so great to the world internally we know our problems and if we don't fix those problems then best believe we're not going to go anywhere as a country and we're just going to keep deteriorating as a country we're going to pocket that my guest tonight is Omohetsu Chikado and uh, uh, Clint Boy Kekana uh, talking about uh, all things uh, youth issues and also advocacy as they are running different programs so we're going to take a quick ad break when we come back we continue with the conversation do stay with us Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto Today. Much appreciated for joining us this evening. Now, tonight we're joined in studio by Omohetu Chikwado, who is the former secretary of the SRC uh, at the 20, Tibet, uh, 20 South Tibet College, as well as Klin Boikegane, who is the leader of programs, particularly in primary schools. So they're both joining me in studio this evening to talk all things young people. Uh, guys, much appreciated for staying on. I mean, I want to touch on those various challenges that we were talking about. I mean, we've highlighted the issues of South Africa being a great country as it is, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a myriad of challenges that are facing this country, especially young people. Let's talk about the issue of unemployment in the country. I mean, we know that uh, the stats are staggering. 45.5% mm -hmm. of South African youth are not working out of the national uh, <coughs> percentage of 32.9%. Quite tricky, if mm -hmm. you may put it that way but yeah. it's almost half of the population of this country. Yeah. What's your take on that? Okay, um, when we're looking at unemployment in South Africa, eventually what I will say is that the education system, let's start with the education system. We are more becoming more of a certified than being qualified uh, youth. Yeah. Because we go to varsity, we go to higher learning of institutes to study the theoretical system of education, whereby at the end of the day, you have your certificate, but you don't have employment. You don't know how to create a building in engineering, but you know it through paper, but you don't know how to create a physical building. Yeah. This is what is happening to South Africa at the current moment. This is why when we're looking at the most uh, um, heavy constructing businesses, they're not being done by South Africans because South Africa at this current state of time, education, it's, it's, it, 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 it has a big uh, impact we have a huge uh, gap between the, the, the real education and the education system that is highly needed yeah. for our people. And when you're looking at unemployment, comparing it to, 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 to 
education, it's, it's a big tricky due to the fact that who's going to hire you? Whereas we have about 100 people who already completed the same qualification as you. Someone has masters, you did a degree, you did a diploma. Who's going to hire you? Let's look at it in, in, in that census. We have a lot of qualifications that are there, but I don't think they're necessary to be there because if we were investing into educational system that allows people to be more into practical, into skills, they'll be able to start their own businesses. And unemployment was, wasn't going to be there at this current state of, uh, of the economy because mm -hmm. there are a lot of skills out there, but they don't know how to challenge those skills. Okay. Um, I'm to, uh, let, 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 I mean, let's talk about this. Uh, mm -hmm. You heard what Lane Boy is saying. Um, it, it's an issue of lack of skills mm -hmm. in the country. People would have the theoretical knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. of a certain um, um, uh, job, uh, if I may put it that way. But um, when it comes to the issues of implementation, is a major problem. I mean, you are from a TVET college. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, um, you know, practical work that goes into TVET colleges and stuff. But it seems like you are being overlooked as TVET colleges in the country. Sure. I mean, you know, um, before I actually left the TVET or when my term as SRC SG came to an end, um, one of our biggest programs that we were trying to push was this TVET rise thing. But people didn't really understand why we kept saying that TVET se the TVET sector needs to rise because, number one, we are a very undermined sector. And we're not just undermined by people who are in university or other people, but we also undermine ourselves as a sector because of what people say to us as, as, as TVET students that we're not employable because we didn't go to a traditional university yeah. or because you come from a TVET sector, you do not meet the requirements to go to university. And that's not the case for the rest of us. Most of us went into TVET sectors because we did not get space into university. And so I can gladly say that what we gain in TVET sectors or at a TVET college, the skills that you are able to acquire at a TVET college are much more better than what you are able to gain at a traditional university because what TVET colleges does is that they give us theory but also back it up with practical work. So TVET colleges actually train us for workspace and TVET colleges actually, actually produce very employable young people in actual fact. The only limitation there is a gap between the TVET sector and traditional institutions of higher learning and I do think that people you know need to be encouraged to 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 go into the TVET sector you know it's not the end of the world if you're unable to go into a, a, a university because of the title I'm a university student yeah. look into other you know aspects like the TVET sector where you are able to get practical work workplace experience you know and also uh, another point is that how we can also bridge the gap between unemployment and young people being at home and not doing anything is also encouraging these young people to go into these TVET sectors and learn practical, physical skills, you know, because, I mean, the requirements of a TVET sector are as minimum as grade nine. Yeah. So you find a lot of young people say that, I don't want to go to school, or I feel like school is not for me, but why not tell your child about the TVET sector? Why not preach about or educate people about TVET sectors where they're able to go and learn things what they want physically and, you know, some way contribute to the economy and it mm. create jobs, you know, because of the skills that they're able to acquire. Clint Boy, before we go to the ad break, I mean, this one is particularly for you. I mean, South Africa faces a reading crisis mm -hmm. uh, where, according to stats, 81% of uh, South African learners in grade four cannot read uh, for meaning. Uh, yeah. So meaning that uh, they cannot read to understand what is in the text. Uh, you've been running, uh, you know, being involved in programs in primary schools. What mm. are the challenges that you actually find when you are mm. dealing with those, uh, 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 um, I mean, programs in, in, in primary school? Okay. Um, okay. When we come back to the primary sector, you know, I think the most challenging problem, it's, it's, it's the way of teaching is the way of teaching because the concentration span of a young child is different from a, an adult. You yeah. know? Um, we can't force a small person to try to educate herself similar to a person who's in high school. You know? Besides the way, the sense of teaching that we have in, 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 in primary schools, the society by itself, the society it doesn't support the educational structure. Mm. This is why we as young people, we need to come back and join ourselves, join hands to assist one another. Because the young ones, when they reach home, it's, it's, it's more like going to play, going to watch cartoons. We are more invested into things that are not necessary for us. 
But what does the language do? I mean, sometimes you go to your primary schools in townships yeah. and then you're being taught English, but uh, the educator also mixes, mixes mm -hmm. the language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with yeah. the language uh, from that community. Maybe either Swana, Soto or Zulu. Yeah, it, it also creates a confusion in the, in, in the thought of the man. This is why most of the time when they start writing, they mix the, 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 the language yeah. because it, it, it creates a sense of confusion. You start writing, uh, let me just say, um, they tell you what is a book in English, but you don't know how to write it. This is why they are unable to read it right? because they are not familiarized with what is being seen and what is being spoken. Because let's not, let us not forget that the young child usually learns through visuals, but not through words. So whatever that the young person sees, it comes to the head and translate it as yeah. a form of, of, of a language. So that thing always creates a, a sense of confusion to the young ones. Yeah. This is why we have high level of illiterate. We're going to take a quick ad break. Uh, when we come back, Bamuhetu, I'm going to start with you. I, I just want to get your comments, particularly looking at the challenges that have been faced by NSFAS uh, for quite some time now. We c we're coming back after this. Welcome back. You're still watching So Much Today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. We are almost at the end of the show and I've been in conversation with Romo Hetu Chikwado, who is the former ST at the 20 South Tibet College and Glenn Boy Kekane, who is a facilitator for primary school programs. They're both joining me uh, in studio just to talk about the state of education and some of the challenges that young people are facing in uh, the country. Uh, Romo Hetu, let me go to you as we wrap up the conversation. The issues of uh, NSFAS. I mean, we know that uh, over 40,000 young people were defunded also in universities. Tibet colleges are still receiving less funding. Uh, there's also late payments when it comes to allocations, either transport, food, accommodation. What seems to be the situation there? Sure. I think, um, I, d I believe things are going to get better with the new appointment of the new uh, administrators in the NSFAS um, financial aid scheme, rather. Um, however, I do think that the challenges that have been faced by uh, particularly Tibet students, I want to speak about Tibet students because yeah. it's the constituency I represent and come from. Um, the biggest challenges, especially with the allowance allocation, was I remember back in the term of SG, there was what we were told about the 60-40 rule, right? And I still question that 60-40 rule because I never really understood what it meant, right? So there was a conversation around 60% being for students who are either tra uh, uh, traveling from home and to school or those that are maybe renting yeah. um, the back room at wherever they're renting. Now, the problem comes when NSFAS does not pay for that month and you are renting at somebody else's uh, residence and you obviously when you come in you sign a contract that does not mention anything to do with NSFAS however you are a beneficiary of NSFAS right so now the challenges come in when NSFAS does not pay off those um, allowances or pay off those um, uh, rental um, fees who then has to pay for them right and so uh, I remember in the past there were a lot of cases where students were kicked out of their residences because they could not pay for rent because NSFAS did not pay you know for their allowances and so I do think that even during registration times a lot of students were sent back because you owe fees and if you don't pay the fees unfortunately you cannot register because at the end of the day the institution needs to keep running right however i don't think it's fair on the student because it's got absolutely nothing to do with the students you know because it's nsf's lack of accountability and lacking to keep responsibility and the commitments that they have set to students right so i think um sure with, uh, with the number of students that are still, you know, being allocated their funds, I'm hoping that it's still going to, yeah. there's still going to be an increase of students that are going to receive their funds so that we see more people, you know, registered into institutions of higher learning. However, I do plead with the NSFAS to be consistent with their payments because we cannot receive NSFAS one month and the next month not yeah. receive it. How then do you keep the relationship with even the people that you stay with, you know, because it seems as if you are lying to them when you say NSFAS has not paid out my fees. But when you signed a contract, you said nothing about NSFAS. So... How then does this, where does the safety of students who stay at residences come in? Yeah. In brief, uh, do you think the minister, the current minister of higher mm -hmm. education should return to that portfolio? I think we should give other people a chance for change, something different, right? And maybe this time, let's bring young people on board, right? Yeah, let's yeah. bring the people that are actually going through the problems, right? Not necessarily the problems, but let's get the representatives, students from the FISMAS4, 
could be the ones that are going to represent us and maybe sit in executive boards of the NSFAS because they know the struggles of the students rather than somebody who does not really, who has not never, who's, ne mm. who's never been affected by the NSFAS. So um, maybe let's consider a collaboration of young people. We're not saying that the current or the former uh, minister of NSFAS or the, 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 yeah, the, the yeah. higher education minister rather should leave. However, we're saying deputize a young person. Let the young person learn from you and let's see what happens from Clean boy, um, I, I want to bring Bring this one to you i mean there are issues on the ground at primary school level and stuff what is your wish uh for um just basic education in general in this country we still have young people that are still crossing rivers mm -hmm. uh you know uh, trying to access education textbooks are not there infrastructure has dilapidated it's a mess in the uh, you know various uh provinces mm -hmm. particularly when you look at basic education yeah okay um my wish currently, it is for the government to be able to put more subsidies into education. Let us also strengthen up our education system from the, from, from the lower basis of education. Yeah. Um, not just to strength, strengthen it up, but the education system that we have, let it build a future. But let us not uh, to be more, 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 more concentrating on things that at the end, we are not sure where we are. You know, when looking at primary, when we're looking at secondary uh, uh, education system, let us create a stance at the younger age so that they can be more practicality because there's a lot to do and there's a lot that the young ones are capable of. Mm -hmm. For you instance, feel that things will change? Um, and that's my question also. Will I think things will change? Yeah. Um, I think they will. I think they will. As much as we are here, we are here to create change. Mm. As much as uh, one we have said, um, we are not here to wait for the government, but we are here to change, create change before the government, so that the government can be able to understand that we as young people, we are here for the change. Mm. As much as we have as a society, as Black Women Caucus. Let me just give you the last words. Um, in 30 seconds each, uh, what would be the message to young people, especially from Black Women Caucus, uh, this Youth Month? Uh, for me, I would say that uh, let us unite. Let us put hands where we thought we would never put hands in. Let us come and unite and create change. Your struggle is not just struggle alone. Mm -hmm. Someone's struggle, it's the whole nation's struggle. If we unite, we can create a better South Africa. One more. So, like Black Women Caucus, the X stands for inclusiveness. That means we're including black men, women of different races, LGBTQAA plus community. What we're saying is that together we can, we're going to create the future fem feminism forward. Together we can. And also, hashtag we organize for survival. And the future is really bright. As, so, as long as we can change our mentality and work together collectively, we are definitely going to conquer. Guys, much appreciated for coming in. Unfortunately, we <laughs> ran out of time, but this was an interesting conversation indeed. Much appreciated for coming. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you for having us. That was Omohetsu uh, Chikwado, who's the former SG at the 20 South Tibet College, and Glenn Boy Kekana, who is the facilitator for primary school programs, talking to us about some of the issues young people still face in the nation. With high rates of unemployment and critical education crisis, it leaves us uh, with the question, did the cracks for better education and uh, essential, you know, essentially a better life made by the youth of 1976 go in vain? It's a question that uh, all of us, we need to answer. Well, that's how we wrap up uh, today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you, so please feel free to talk to us about this episode. Send us an email at SowetoToday at SowetoTV.co.za or you can give us a call or WhatsApp us at 0815318. Bahai Turidi Lehulekani from myself, Tabo Mulukwani, and the rest of the team. It's good night from us, and thank you for watching. <laughs>